sure everybody was up bright and early at the crack of dawn or before the crack of dawn. Some of you were. I got a few late night submissions this morning at about 4 a.m. or so. I wasn't up. But, uh, um, so I'm glad to see all of you are here. Um, make sure you have your cards and do like what Claudius did. Somehow make it stand up in a way so I can see you. At some point I'm going to remember your names, but it's a good way to start the introduction because there are more of you who are coming. So I'm actually going to take attendance. It's an old-fashioned way for me to help remember who you are. And we'll start off and we'll figure out what we're going to do for the day. So I'm going to go in regular alphabetical order. So Alexander. Brian. Claudius. Yes, sir. Fine, we got one here. Ivan. Diana is here. Frederick is here. They got the front row seats. Stephen, there you are. Jeffrey. Okay. Victor. Good morning. Jean Pierre. Yes, sir. All right. Panagiotta. Are you saying that right? I guess not. We'll find out. Juan. Here you are. Thank you. Chadwick. Here. Oh, there you are. Thank you. I'm going to get the face and the name together eventually. Brandon, right there. Emmanuel. <coughs> and that's Jeff, right? Yeah. Okay, he just walks in. It's good to see him. All right. Marianella. There you are. Olivia. Carol. Here. There you are. Thank you. Quincy. There's a. All right, thanks. Rebecca. Kyle. Paul, Viviana, Erica, Nick, there we are, okay, 16, 16 out of 26, hello, and who is this this morning? Good morning to love. Yeah, hi, how are you? Hi, good morning. So, here's our agenda for the day, and it's going to be a very full day. And so hopefully by the time you leave at the end of the day, you're just going to be reeling from all this information. But uh, that's part of the benefit of just having these four extraordinary sessions, if you will. And so, just so you understand what's going to happen, we're going to do some introductions, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, our guest speaker, Vishal Papa, hopefully will find his way, is going to be presenting to us all about Reese, which I think you'll find interesting. Then we'll have Susan Berkman continue what I'll call part two of library and research tools. And then I'll come in and talk about real capital analytics, which is another great tool and resource. And then we'll get into a number of different lectures. We'll talk about what's going on. We'll get into the meat of what we call the development process, if you will. Uh, and then after lunch, uh, Dr. Fred will come in with financial numbers, and that's why I made sure all of you brought your computers at some point later today, we're going to be using them. And then we'll get into case studies, class exercises, and more. So what I'd like to do now, actually for the first thing, because this is my way to help you introduce yourself to your fellow class members, and for me to get to know you, is that I'm going to give you each one minute to do an elevator speech. In fact, I gave you a hint of that, and I said, I want to know why you're here. I want you to be able to tell your fellow students, your soon-to-be, you know, network, you know, mates, if you will, who are going to start your career off, uh, why you're here, what you're all about. And so it's a long elevator ride, I guess, and I don't know what a minute would be in an elevator ride. Just past the summer, actually, well, actually, in the month of June, I took a trip around the world and did it in 23 days. And the high point, physically at least, on planet Earth was my going to the Burj Al Khalifa, which is the tallest building in the world in Dubai. Anybody been there by any chance? You have. And did you go to the top of the building? No. Okay, well, I only went as far as to let, you know, plebeians like us go because you have to pay to get to the 168th floor or whatever it is, so we got to the 154. So that may have been a minute long elevator ride. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to retreat to that seat back there, and I'm going to call in no particular order. I'm going to ask you to come up and just tell me about who you are. You're going to make your presentation, and frankly, you're going to be selling yourself. So, why don't you start off actually with Erica? Why don't you go to the front of the room? 
tell us a little bit about yourself, and I'll give you that minute to figure out what you're going to be here. <laughs> and if you hear a little beat here, because I'm going to be using my uh, iPhone here just to time you, so I doubt any of you are going to go over a minute, but we'll see what happens. Okay, excuse me, because I'm not a public speaker. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm currently a paralegal. I work at a real estate firm. I um, am interested in getting into commercial properties. I would like to own them, lease them, so hopefully I can learn more about that. Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> These are your future lawyers, future investment bankers. What else do you want to tell them? <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you, Erin. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Jean-Pierre Johnson, or J.P. Johnson for short. Um, this program actually, the reason I'm interested is because it gave, I think it gives me an opportunity to learn different aspects. I'm on the resident, just like Marion Marinello. I was a realtor before. I currently work with Fannie Mae. I'm just an asset manager. So I, on the residential side, I think I understand from beginning to end on the institutional side. But I think on the development side, this is an opportunity to learn the nuts and bolts. I think, like Marina said, a lot of people are moving, once they do the residential, they say, what's next? Personally, I think, what's next for me? When I accomplish this program, I'm looking to obtain my CCIM. I don't know if anybody knows what the CCIM is. It's a PhD in commercial real estate. And this program offers you three to four classes to become a CCIM. So any realtors involved in this program, I think the next step 
is to look forward to the CCIM. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Katie. So how about Frederick, please? Good morning, class. My name is Frederick Griffin. My background is in finance. I, I currently uh, now as a consultant for mining companies uh, in the Middle East and in Africa, demonstrating uh, food or whatever my plan on that um, Right now, um, I, I wrote a statement um, for the MSRD that this program would provide me with the knowledge to seek out opportunities that will propel my visions into reality allow me to transform undeveloped land into the future marketable structures and project what tomorrow's consumers and businesses will need. Thank you. All right, let's have Brandon. Hello class, my name is Brandon Noodleman. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from Florida State University. I majored in real estate. I didn't always want to do real estate. I chose finance, but then I took my first real estate class and found it to be very interesting. Inter interesting. So I switched my uh, undergraduate degree to real estate. Um, in my undergrad, most of the real most of the real estate I learned was all on the financial side. Uh, I would love to learn more on the development side here. And uh, I start working in two weeks as a project manager assistant. Along with that, I will be working on an Aplex with my father, and I think this working side by side would be very beneficial. Thank you. Thank you. Claudius, please come up. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. My name is Claudius Carnegie, and I'm both a student and an alumnus here at NOLA. And my background is engineering. I'm a professional engineer, and I've been working in the real estate field, uh, I, I break the elements down in the real estate spectrums, pre-development, development, marketing, and o and M. I've been operating from the development end to the back end. So now I'm pursuing this program to try and develop my skills and understanding in the pre-development end. And then I'm going to try and find a niche in that pre-development end that uh, I can plug into a corporation that I currently own uh, to uh, to expand my understanding and operating at the front end of the real estate industry. I'm currently working as a professor and running my own business. Thank you. All right, great. All right, next let's have Jeffrey. Good morning, my name is Jeff Hurd. I have a background in finance and real estate. I have IU, uh, particularly got interested in hotel development, and also attended the School of Hospitality where I took uh, a lot of my electives in hotel development, feasibility. Uh, after school, I went to work for developers in resort development in the Florida area. The timing was particularly challenging. Uh, this was probably around 08, 09, when everything hit the fan, and it became, it became uh, very tough to kind of gain employment with other employers as all this was going on. So I currently work for Offices of Facilities Management and Physical Plant here at NOVA. And uh, I'm looking to, to continue to grow with the organization, but get back into resort development as I get further into, you know, into the program and also develop leadership skills. Finance, international business, and trade. I'm currently employed at Altman Development. I do a lot of multifamily housing. Um, I started there as a financial analyst and currently a development associate. Uh, when I first started there, I didn't know what the hell I was getting into. But over the years, I gained a passion for what development actually is. You, know, you take your ideas, you put it on paper, and actually bring it into reality. So working there gave me the opportunity to actually know what careers I'm getting into. So I'm here today to tighten up my skills and hopefully be able to expand within my company and hopefully one day go out my own. Uh, good 
morning. Tula Mana. I own um, three commercial, not for now, commercial properties. Uh, the restaurants own them. It's Flashback Diner. I'm also, I also have the award for the RFB for the Deerfield Beach Cafe in Deerfield Beach. And so therefore I've done quite a bit of commercial real estate purchasing. Yesterday we were honored to have another MOI that was signed and we're moving forward with a spectacular property in downtown Fort Lauderdale that I always wanted for three years negotiating. So I'm very excited to be here. I also do, I'm the panelist very often in universities regarding SBA 504 loans because this is how I've done everything I did for about 20 years. I'm very glad that there's other people in this room that are about my age and I don't feel lonely in one more years. <laughs> and um, I have a lot to learn and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. One. Good morning. Um, my name is Juan Martin. Uh, left Venezuela when I was 17 years old. I went to England and um, I learned about town planning. And uh, ever since it's been in my mind. Um, then Margaret Thatcher came in power. Foreigners have to leave. Study there. I went to California and um, I went to art school. I major painting, and, uh, photography, and I graduated. I went to New York for do masters in Parsons. Uh, I didn't have the financial, so I went home and, uh, to Venezuela after many years and came back. I couldn't make a living there, I couldn't make a living here in art. <laughs> so I studied graphic design and I was getting ten dollars an hour being a graphic designer. You know. Okay, the elevator ride's over. Thank you. Thank you very much. much. <laughs> Carol, how about you next please? Good morning everyone. Are you ready today? My name is Carol Roy Jones. I'm very excited to be here. Um, being at NOVA for me was seeking an answer to a question. Uh, I specialize, I'm in doubling, and now specialize in redeveloping properties, residential, and I'm ready to move into multifamily. But more than that, I wanted to form a team. I'm here to learn about developing and also to learn about you. I want to know what your passion is, what you're working, because more than anything else, you need to be able to trust the person you're working with. And that's one of the reasons I want to be here. My background is in finance and being in finance. I'm also a CPA. But more than that, I care about people and making things happen. Thank you. Thank you. Great. How about Nick? Good morning. Um, my name is Nick Wolf. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm a uh, husband and father. I got a six year old and three year old boy that I'm going to be Heisman Trophy winner someday. <laughs> I'm a second generation builder. Uh, my background is civil engineering and heavy highway construction, as well as a lot of commercial site work. And I'm here to learn to, uh, I'm, I'm wanting to move from the contractor side to the owner side and learn uh, how to do the initial analysis and the pre construction phase to mitigate my risk. Uh, residential, multifamily, industrial infrastructure. I'm not concerned with that as much as being able to identify uh, good deals and be able to act on with confidence. So, great. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle. Uh, my name is Kyle Thompson. I'm a recent college graduate with a degree in psychology. Um, I'm relatively new to the real estate business. I've only been a residential realtor for about six months now. So you guys are a little intimidating with all your experience, not gonna lie. But uh, yeah, for the most part, I just, um, you know, I got really interested in real estate and just kind of looking to learn more. Um, I haven't picked uh, one general thing that I would like to go into, so I'm just trying to keep an open mind and keep it broad to begin with. 
Uh, I do a lot of re uh, just uh, single family homes, luxury. You can also do a lot of investment sales, 1031 exchanges, uh, redevelopments, foreclosures, you can name it, I probably touched it uh, somewhere in real estate. Uh, I probably sold $20 million in the past two years, which is about top of all that. Um, and I'm here, basically I did an internship at Summer of Styles and focusing on retail development, uh, doing research for Publix. Publix is Chipotle, Starbucks, and Walmarts in the Tri-County area. Don't see Publix was in Miami-Dade. And basically, I don't know where I want to do yet. The program to me has been awesome. Um, it opened my eyes to everything, and I'm just touching everything. So, Great, thank you. I think we got everybody. At least everybody who's here. Good. So, so why do you think? Why do you think that we? That I feel that introductions like this are important. You can streamline the course to suit our needs. Well, that's part of it too, as well. Uh, oh, raise your hand so I can figure out who's saying what here. Okay, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good introduction to know uh, who you're going to be working with and who you're going to be working with. And I think that you like to network with. As if we have a choice. Okay, yes. <laughs> you were going to say something, Kevin? Uh, this, this program focuses a lot on presentation because uh, it's the business world and you're going to need to present and deals. That's a really good point. So, you know, no matter how great your ideas are, no matter what it is that you can write down, you have to have the ability to make a compelling presentation. Now, as I said, that was a minute, and that's a long elevator ride. In fact, often you don't even get that much time to make an impression, to shake someone's hand, look them in the eye, and say, this is what I'm all about. And so while we can't teach you those skills here alone, just being able to get up and do that, interacting with your classmates, and thinking about how you do that in your daily life, business, personal, I think is really important. Because real estate is very much about appearances, about the property, about the project, and yes, about the people too, as well. And so I thought it was very interesting to hear the introduction. By the way, was there a theme that anybody surmised from everything that we heard from the 18 or so of you who spoke? Everybody's excited. Uh, yes, I hope that's the case. <laughs> we're going to say that's a given. Yes, Amana. Trying to figure out what we're going to be when we grow up. Um, uh, and I'm still figuring that out, too. Right? Uh, so, you know, at some point, you will actually, you'll figure it out. You just won't know that you figured it out. And that's another challenge, too. Yes, Nick? Well, it's a question. How many, uh, if you guys are the only two left when you started, how many people started? Why are there only two left? Well, because the way the way this, the schedule was done before, um, not that I'm left, but like they're going to be coming in the second part of the semester. For instance, it used to be instead of having two uh, eight week sessions, it was just a sixteen week session. You know, uh -huh. just changed it. So they, by that they also graduated too. So we we are, we, we only we're only two people that I think started uh, from April to you know, Everyone else just finished the program or uh, just continued. So they're not late bloomers. That's good to know. Okay. Great. All right. So look, this is just the start, and we're going to be interacting amongst ourselves throughout the uh, this intensive eight-week session, if you will. So that was our introduction. If you understand that, then hopefully that's a great way to deal with it. Let me see if I can get this to work. Here we go. Okay. And so what I'd like to do is really dive in right now. We have a guest speaker from Reese. That's Michelle Coppe. He'll come up in just a minute. He's waving his hand. He's the only one who chose to wear a tie this morning, which is very good because he's representing a company himself and he wants to make the right appearance too. And I can't stress that enough. And it's okay, we're casual, it's Saturday, but uh, think about that too as well. And so we're here not only to learn about development, but how to in fact become a developer in whatever phase that means, wherever you end up in the spectrum of the process. And to do that well, you need to have the right tools and a lot of today is going to be about tools. Tools in research, tools in looking at the market, tools in understanding how to run the numbers, if you will. And that's why we're going to have the kind of focus that we will today on that. So, Michelle, I'd like you to come up. I think you loaded your presentation here somewhere on the machine. And he's going to give us a demonstration as well. Let's see if we can find uh, your presentation. And then hopefully you'll be able to go online. Yes. <laughs> morning, everybody. How's everybody doing Saturday morning? I had a chance to hear everybody's introductions and it's a very uh, diverse group of audience. A lot of experience here in the classroom. 
uh, a lot more expensive than me, at least in the commercial real estate space. But uh, just for a quick introduction, since we're in the spirit of introductions today, uh, my name is Michal Fava. I'm an account manager at Reese. Has anyone heard of Reese before? Does that ring a bell? Uh, so Reese is basically a commercial real estate data and analytics provider. So uh, we provide data analytics research to anybody who has capital at risk within commercial real estate. So that means anyone on the debt or the equity side. So a bank, an asset manager, or CMBS investor, or an educational institution you wanting to utilize our research for academic purposes, government entities, Fannie and Freddie. So really anybody uh, you know, in the commercial real estate space will utilize uh, our data and our research to make investment decisions, buy, hold, and sell decisions. Uh, and we've been in the industry since 1980, uh, and I'll go a little bit into our methodology, our history, our background, how we help our clients. Uh, and I've actually just recently joined Reese a couple months ago in uh, financial services for about eight or nine years prior to joining Reese. I was at Moody's for a number of years in account management. So uh, I definitely look forward to an engaging conversation as I go through the presentation. Please feel free to stop. If you need to ask any questions, anything I can help clarify, I uh, definitely want to make sure that you get a lot of value out of the tools that you'll have at your disposal. Uh, and get a lot of that uh, you know, out of this tool to incorporate it in, in your research. That you like. and, and one reason why I find it's important to have Reese up front because you're going to be using this tool. Everyone here will get a subscription to this service, so that it will be part of your major study project that you're doing for this class. All right, great. So let's get started. Uh, just a quick agenda, um, you know, Reese overview, a little bit about our history, the property types that we cover, our methodology behind our data collection, uh, schedule about our data releases, and then we'll dive into the presentation. So we've been around since 1980, a leader in commercial real estate data and analytics. As you can see there by the num sheer numbers there, we cover, we have a national coverage within the United States, 275 markets, over 280,000 uh, properties that are covered in our database. Uh, we have over a thousand subscribers, so what I mean by that is uh, any client, whether it's a bank or an educational institution, will sign up for a subscription uh, and they'll get the data and the, user, the end users who get access to the data will be utilizing that as much as they need uh, to help with their workflow. 70% uh, of Reese reports are transactional, that means a lot of our clients will use our data to make these investment decisions. Should I buy, should I hold, should I sell uh, properties that are in my portfolio? Just in terms of our database, uh, we have a survey methodology. So what we do, we have actually a very large economic uh, research and analyst team that will actually have built relationships over the last 30, 35 years with developers, property owners, building managers. We call on these individuals to get updated information on key data, like rent, what's the current asking rent, what's the vacancy uh, and inventory. So all the data that we're gonna go through as we move along the presentation is really co collected at the ground level from our surveyors. So this, this is, I would say, two thirds of our companies dedicated on the research side. Um, so you can see 280,000 properties, as you can see, contact owners, uh, building managers, and leasing agents were asking some of those key data points, concessions, rents, operating expenses, and so forth. Um, at the rent level, new construction level, we're tracking all projects all the way from uh, whether a project is at uh, an exploratory stage all the way to the completed stage. So proposed plan under construction and completed, several sources, permit divisions, planning boards. Gives you a sense of uh, the diversity of our search that we uh, go through when we, uh, as we build our database or as we've built it over the years. And also at the sales uh, capital markets transaction level, we're tracking sales of 250,000 and above. Uh, we're getting sale date, sale price, buyer and seller information, a lot of capitalization rates. So we look, look, if we have reported cap rates, we'll provide that as well as we a lot of pro forma analysis as well. I'll go through that. Uh, just property type coverage. When it comes to sales and new construction, we have a very expanded coverage for apartments. We'll look at rent regulated, federal subsidized. As an example, office, we may look at non competitive buildings, office condos, medical office, in addition to our normal inclusion criteria, which I'm going to touch on. So, as I was saying, inclusion criteria. So what is it, what kind of properties are we capturing in our database? For apartments, rents must be at least market rate rentals uh, with 40 units, at least 40 units, except in 
tertiary markets, uh, which really means markets that we have not been tracking for a long period, so recent. Uh, and those are at least 20 units, except in California and Arizona. Within office, we look at multi and single tenant offices with at least 15,000 square feet. And then for retail, we're looking at multi tenant and we break out retail into neighborhood and community shopping centers with at least 10,000 square feet. So these are minimum criteria uh, for properties to be included in our database. And seniors housing, uh, we have, uh, we break it out into independent living, assisted living, memory care, and skilled nursing, uh, at least 20 unit beds or more. So we, these are the uh, markets that uh, that is part of the access here. So yes? As part of your database, I mean, do you guys just focus on financial data and market info, or do you also provide the plans? Uh, well, we break it out into what we call space market, capital markets, right? So the data is going to be space market, rent vacancies, inventories, under construction, uh, the phase of what stage a particular property is in terms of construction, and then capital markets would be sales, transaction, cap rates, uh, and then economic demographic data. So those, those are the data points that we cover. I think what you're referring to is more uh, development planning, is that right? Or Correct. Yeah, the same plan. Oh, I see that. Uh, we'll have pictures of properties, uh, you know, what the infrastructure is around a property that's being built, but, but not, I think, not what you're referring to. One of your competitors does more pictures, if you will. You know, <laughs> is that CoStar? CoStar, that's right. And we'll be talking to you about that, too, as well. But I stood up for a reason, and I realized that Michelle, myself, Susan, and, and Dr. Forgery are going to be using terminology, terms, names of ideas and concepts that some of you do not know. And I can see from our introduction, we've got a wide range of skills and experience from those of you who are just diving in to some of you who have been in the business in some way, shape, or form. And so if there is a term you don't understand, raise your hand, I'm sure he'll answer that, and I'll try to answer that too as well. And for those of you who know that you're ahead of the others, let them catch up to us, because I don't want you to skip that because you may look at this and say, great. Uh, you may say, well, wait a second, what is memory care? Now, maybe you'll understand that when we get to seniors housing. Do people know the difference, for example, between a primary market, a secondary market, and a tertiary market? I'm not asking if you know the answer, but it's a question, if you will. So if you see something that doesn't quite click, just raise your hand. So that was kind of a quick uh, rundown of all the different markets criteria here. Uh, data updates. We're updating our data really on a quarterly basis. Prior to the quarter, we'll update what's called a first glance report, so a sneak peek into the data that's going to be rolling out. We have a team of PhD economists at Reese that will provide insight and commentary on some of the data and, and give you a really good qualitative analysis of, uh, of the raw data, really. And 30 days after the calendar quarter, all our data get replenished in that database. This is really important, and as, you know, a lot of clients ask me, you know, why 30 days? You know, clients in really financial services are really data starved people. They need data constantly updated for their models and, and uh, their portfolios and things of that nature. But 30 day time lag really is for us to do rigorous quality control and quality assurance of the data. So once we collect that data, we have different methods of uh, verifying that data. We'll do random recalls, random sample recalls to the uh, client to, to our uh, relationships that we've built up. We'll also cross-reference through different sources, make sure that our, our data is highly accurate. On a monthly basis, there's a monthly option for certain clients as well. And then on a weekly basis, our new construction pipeline information is updated. Uh, and then on a daily basis, all our sales transactions are updated. So we talked about that database, that's really the foundation. It, it puts us in a unique position uh, you know, within this data world because uh, if clients have questions on the data, we're not relying on another company to provide us data, right? Everything is in-house, QA'd and in-house, QA'd and QC in-house. So we're experts on our data, it puts us in that unique position. We can talk about that data, we can get things fixed for our clients if there are any issues. So that really lays the foundation for the delivery platform that we're going to touch on today, Reese 2.0, uh, which is a web-based tool. Uh, and it's going to provide market analysis. We'll uh, look at data at the property level all the way up to the national level, uh, and then transaction-related data, uh, as well as analytical tools, which we're not going to get into. But uh, 
that's kind of a high level overview. Any questions before we delve into the product demo? Sure. <clears throat> so, um, what was your position before the market crash in 2007, 2006? Did you actually foresaw that when you were publishing market analysis? Right, and that's a good question. I mean, for, for Reese, we're, we're really, you know, when we do our projections, we're not really getting into, you know, we will have downside scenarios. So it's possible in 2007 we gave a downside scenario if there was a stress, but I think at that point, uh, you know, nobody really know what, what the level of downside would be. But when we go into the product demo, there is a really important section where we project what rents, vacancies, inventories that really the commercial real estate market would look like if there was a severe stress in the economy. So to answer your question, were we able, did we predict that there was going to be you know, a crash in 08, the mortgage crisis? We're, we're not in that industry to, to predict, but we do uh, provide as a forecast for investors to make that decision, saying if there is a severe downside or stress in the economy, uh, what, how is that going to impact the commercial real estate industry, particularly these key data points? Does, does that that help uh, in our body of the Is the headquarters located in Maryland? Or? Uh, no, we're in New York. We're based in New York. We have a small team in California now as well, in Orange County, but we're headquartered in New York City. One of the things that's interesting about their work is that, yes, they're based in New York City, but in fact, they have every property as their field representative because they're reporting in. All those properties have uh, faith and confidence that the data that is presented to them is not only rigorous, but is confidential when it needs to be. And it's that kind of reputation that Reese has, along with some other providers in the business, that allows us to feel comfortable about the data that's provided. Body, do you have a question? Yes. Um, how do we go about becoming a student member? Someone mentioned that. Right. So uh, you, you should be getting uh, access to the website. Uh, I've been working with a professor here to get a list of all the users that are going to need access. So if you haven't already, the emails that were provided to Reese, uh, you'll be getting a welcome email from Reese that will contain login credentials. Has anybody gotten that yet? Yes. Okay. There we go. All right. Great. So um, some of you online, and, and Vishal will show you how to do so as well. So what I'm doing is just logging in. So this is the email that I have. Company email and then you'll have your password. So similar way that you would log in as well. Um, question. The access that we're getting is like the access that any members will be getting or we have restrictions to that? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about um, how much you can and cannot do. It's yeah. a good question. So let's go through the, uh, uh, the site and we'll tell you a little bit more. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that. So here's the landing page. Once you log in, this is your quick landing page. Just a couple of highlights, uh, you know, quick uh, national market data analysis. Here are some links uh, to some key news and events. But one thing before I get started is that Reese, we believe in a bottom-up approach when it comes to commercial real estate research. So what that means is looking at data all the way down at the property level, understanding the dynamics at the property level, doing comparisons of comparable properties, and then aggregating that data up to what we call the sub-market, which we'll get into uh, metro, regional, and national levels. So looking at everything from the leaves all the way up to the, to the, you know, to the forest, so to speak. So I'm going to click on the property comps here. And the best way to go about this is to put in an address uh, for a particular project or a property that you're interested in running a comparison for. So I've, I've got a couple of addresses. Uh, I've pulled up a couple of different metros that you know we could possibly talk about. We, I have some Charlotte office. I've got apartments in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Any preference or anything but South Florida? No South Florida. <laughs> Tulsa, Tulsa, um, booming market in Charlotte. Tulsa, Oklahoma, I think is not part of the subscription. I think that we have on the Yeah, I don't think we. So the subscription that we have uh, for you is the three counties in the South Florida, Miami, Dade, uh, Broward County, and Palm Beach uh, area. And when you do your study and your project, I'll get a little bit ahead of myself, so I hope you don't mind <coughs> inserting here. Uh, we're gonna ask you to identify a site, and you're gonna be using the tools that you have here to figure out a lot about a particular site. 
And so, frankly, uh, I didn't want to make sure, well, Hausa or Chattanooga, or if you wanted to get on a plane, I guess you could go to Las Vegas and figure out that site. But we wanted to really focus it here on our South Florida market. And so Reese, if you had a paid subscription, if you're like some of us who actually use this, you can go to any of the metropolitan areas they've got all over the country. Uh, but So that's why I wanted the shower to focus on something outside of South Florida, because I don't want them to do your homework, uh, if you will. Uh, so the subscription is incredibly varied, but we're going to focus on all property types within South Florida. But we'll focus now today, I like the idea, on, on apartments, offices, other things like that, just to give you a feel for how it works. Sure. So, uh, you know, Charlotte is a very booming market, particular for office as well as... Uh, Anybody been to Charlotte? Okay, a few of you It's changed, right? The last 10, 15 years, it's just been such a dramatic change. Uh, so here, what I did is I put in an address that I happen to have, 1800 Continental Boulevard. So you want to put that in, city, your state. Zip code is optional. You want to drop down and make sure you have the right property type. So if you know this is an office, which this is in this case, Make sure I click on that. And we have an age size algorithm built into this uh, platform. So if you know the year built, uh, 1995, and you can get that when you log in, you can actually search for all different addresses in particular metro and get all this information. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll demo that as well. So this will, this is intuitive enough where it will pull comparable sets. So 30 comps on the rent side, 50 most recent sales, uh, based on the age and the size that you enter. So it will uh, search within that criteria. So 130,000 square feet uh, for this particular property in terms of size. And the search radius, how far or how narrow do you want your search? You can go down as far as one-tenth of a mile. Uh, you can go up to uh, 25 miles or so. So we can leave it at five. Click on this advanced search feature here. Further allows you to drill down and narrow your search or expand your search and uh, really uh, tighten the filter. So building class, class A and B, C, are, are people familiar with the class A versus BC concept? So uh, if you had no, then help them out a little bit. Sure. Thank you. So really class, uh, the way we define classes is based on rent, size, age, and location in that order. So a class A building is you know, going to have higher rents, bigger size, more posh uh, location where there's a lot of activity, a lot of demand, a lot of cash flow. Uh, and lo location, right? And BC is going to have probably less of that. So BC properties are going to have lower rents. Uh, you know, a lot of investors will uh, try to purchase BCs at lower prices and have to turn them around, renovate them, and turn them into Class A. So uh, Class A is probably is a class going to focus on A and BC, or um, we don't know yet. Yeah. We're going to see what they're doing. Sure. Okay. And but then, uh, question yes. that ABC also is for like rentals or like every type of property or particular property, like the levels of? For market rate rentals, so uh, yeah, market rate rentals really. So if you're looking at subsidized uh, housing and things like that, that's really you know, not going to be part of this. So uh, that's ABC would be that. Rent range, you can enter that in. Uh, and here we put five miles, as I mentioned. If you click on this tab here, it says sales comp. If you're looking at sales data, right, you have the uh, option of including all the different property types. Do you want sales on medical offices? Do you want sales data on condos, non edited buildings? You can do that. I'll leave everything as default right now so we get all the data. You can also narrow down by sales price, price per square foot, when was it built, what the building size is, if you have that information, if you have buyer-seller information, you could do that as well. You go down here, you can expand the sales uh, radius search that's, that's unique to just the sales transactions to you know, more than five miles. So you can uh, make each of these the search radius uh, unique to each uh, type of comp that we're going to run. For uh, under construction, as I mentioned earlier, proposed plan, under construction and complete, all the four phases that we track. Uh, when do you expect it to complete? If you want to enter that information, you can do that as well. Just want to give you a sense of uh, how granular you can get with your search. You can get very granular. There's no question about it. And so there's such a wealth of information uh, and, and I've asked Kishaw to dive deep into it. Um, and, but there are ways also to start at top level, and we're going to show that too as well. So you, you don't get overwhelmed by the information, but the beauty is that once you know what you need to look for, then you can take the plunge. Right. I hit this magic button here, search, and 
and that's going to pull up all the different comps. So here it's searching for all the rent comps based on our criteria and our age and size algorithms. We're 1995 to 130,000 square foot. It's going to look at within that range, and uh, what's going to come up is you're going to get the, you're going to see the, the tab that's going to come up will have a map. Uh, it's, that map's going to have all the different properties. We'll have some, some color coded push pins there. Uh, and then you'll see PDF and Excel data, which I'll touch on here in just a moment while this loads up. Uh, probably early in the morning for the computer, too. Right, I was just going to say, uh, <laughs> to a good doctor here, do we get the slow internet, or is yeah. this a very complicated uh, property that we're searching? <laughs> it could be that there's a lot of data here for this particular one. Let's just give it a minute. Whoops, yeah, I think I saw something. Yeah. Right. You, usually, folks, it comes up within seconds, frankly. Uh, there we go. rent here. There's not enough data for this particular property. Let me do this. Let's go back here. So as I was mentioning earlier, instead of, if you don't have an address, if you don't have specific information, you can click on this tab here, Metro Submarket. So let's say we're looking at uh, apartments within Charlotte. Just click search. This is going to give us all the different comps. So I'm just going to do this because we didn't get enough data for that particular address that I had. But this is an overview of the Charlotte apartment market. And down here, all, all the different addresses of uh, size, unit, year, build, and class. So I want to point your attention to the map. These yellow push bins are highlighting all the different properties. You can click on any one of them, it'll give you a quick sense of the uh, market. Sub market, is anyone familiar with the concept of sub market? Uh, All right, so, so we have one out of 18. I think you'll have to explain that too as well. Sure. So sub within a metro, uh, you can divide it into various sub-markets because uh, within commercial real estate, uh, different sections of a metro can perform differently, right? So in, at Reese, we break out sub-markets or delineate based on natural, man-made, economic boundaries. So that's how we break it out. So for example, downtown Charlotte or uptown Charlotte, uh, my properties there might perform very differently than if you go three miles down. And that's why some markets are very important to understand how, you know, one piece of a metro is stacking up against another piece when you're making these decisions and studying the data. One thing that's interesting is you just focus on this map, and, and I think what we're going to learn, you'll see this in, in, as he goes through his presentation, that visual representation of data can play a wonderful role in understanding lots of numbers and data points. And so if, and for those of you who know Charlotte, and, and you'll, if you just heard what Michelle said, he switched from downtown to uptown, because in Charlotte, the city fathers and mothers decided that downtown was too downscale, so they call their downtown uptown because it's higher up, uh, just mentally, if you will. But the point here is interesting, is that you look at the interstate highways, you look at the beltway or, or the perimeter around the city, you look at the highways across it, and oftentimes that's what divides and creates sub-markets. There are other things that do that too, geography. If you look at the rivers and the lakes, if you look at municipal boundaries, such as the state line, in fact, Charlotte is just at the edge of South Carolina. You see the word clover, actually that's in South Carolina. And so when we look at sub-markets, think about here in South Florida, sub-markets might be east of 95, west of 95. It could be east of the Intracoastal, west of the Intracoastal, and of course in cities and towns as well. And so the beauty of this kind of data is you can begin immediately to say, what's my sub-market or what's my general market? And you'll find this in real estate throughout your career, and if you can define those parameters well, then you'll get a better set of data as a result. Sure. And uh, you know, as we're talking about sub-markets, if you click on this little box here, you see this color coding in the map. This is telling us all the different submarkets within Charlotte. And these are submarkets for apartments. Submarkets for different product types change. Does everybody understand why that's the case? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. You can zoom in here. You can also change into a bird's eye view. A lot of clients like this to get a sense of uh, major highways, and you can kind of see it here already, but you could zoom in all the way down to ground level here to get a sense of how every you know, the roads, which major 
highways or how the infrastructure is around your subject or a cluster of different properties. So that's the bird's eye view. What we were looking at earlier was the road or the standard. <coughs> So is the submarket like similar to like just different neighborhoods? Uh, you could say that. I, mean, I guess in one sense, it's uh, yeah. You could say that you know there are different pockets of sections yeah. within a metro. Like one area will show like a downtown one. The submarket would be like a downtown area. Right. Yeah. 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 And every city has their own definitions. And what Reese has done is with most of the other services, they basically use the definitions that the local real estate professionals follow there too as well. So once again, if you were to look at what's downtown here in Fort Lauderdale, it would be very different than in Miami, mm -hmm. in West Palm, or certainly in uptown Charlotte. So now this shows what is listed, actually, but not leased yet, right? This is, uh, no, this is, this is, it's not listing information. It's basically properties that are in our database and data on those properties and then comparison and averages of those properties within a particular sector, and what their average rents are, what their average uh, vacancies are, what uh, their inventory looks like, right? And then, and then sales data of what properties within this uh, search parameter has sold for, what are they currently selling for, and, uh, and then trending information, forecasting how our rents going to move three years, four years, five years from now within the Charlotte market. So that's more of the data. It's not, not so much listing. I think CoStar, you, you would get more listing. Yes, yeah. let's make a distinction here. What's great about all of these different platforms, each one has a particular strength. So the strength that Reese brings to the table is all about property and market-specific information. And they overlay it with demographics, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Another provider like CoStar or Real Capital Analytics provide transaction information. And so, Tula, when you're saying, well, is it listed? So, for example, that's also, yet again, a third element. So, transaction data is, has a property sold? Now, we're not going to see whether a property sold or not. We're seeing how a property performs when you're looking at REITs. When we go to CoStar, or Real Capital Analytics, we'll know when and what did the property sell for. Now, the data is a little bit in the REITs information, but you wouldn't look for a transaction with REITs. You're looking for the information about the properties and the markets. So it's for feasibility studies and all of that. So all of this is for feasibility. And how we define feasibility, and I realize we're going to have lots of questions about this, is that we're giving you lots of tool sets. And then we have to figure out what's the right way to use them, whether it's for a feasibility analysis, a marketability analysis, or whether it's a demographic or economic analysis. And so hopefully we'll be able to parse those kinds of things. The benefit of having this tool, and, and I see some of you have them on your screen, that's great, you're looking at it right now. Um, the benefit of having the tool is once you know what you're looking for, you can do the deep dive. And we'll show you if it gives you the overview, but the challenge is you have to be an informed user as well. So uh, and maybe the cart's a little bit before the horse here, uh, so we're going to help get you informed about doing that. Yes? Um, sorry. Earlier I saw that you Play categories of what you guys focus on. Don't you think that um, that's kind of like a, is it really inclusionary to everything that's out there? Uh, because you're you're basically showing um, certain buildings that are like 40 units or above. Right. But what about those that are like 30 or 20? Do you think that's there's another sub market that you're ignoring? Um, and how accurate is that information? It's a good question. Those are very good questions. I mean, we feel that uh, within that inclusion criteria, it really meets what we call market rate or investment grade properties. So when we do the trending and we do the forecasting, um, you know, we're including what we consider investment grade and most investment grade properties. So a lot of times what can happen is if you're including, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, you know, unit size that are a lot smaller, you could do that, but it, throw, it may throw off when you're forecasting out a lot of the data. So uh, you know, over the years of uh, working with our clients, uh, you know, this has kind of been determined like the right point for us to uh, you know, do the forecasting and trending, which is really what most of our clients, the biggest value they get from us is the forecasting, because then they can know what kind of cash flows a bank is going to get a sense of what kind of cash flows are going to get out of those properties. So, so let me expand a little bit on that. Okay, so 
when when Bishal mentions investment grade criteria, uh, you know, at some point, if you were to let's use this example, you find a five unit apartment building somewhere in Wilton Manors and say, I want to invest in it, I want to figure that out. Those types of properties are generally so unique, so specific, that their criteria don't match up well from an investment perspective. But what they've done is they said, okay, about 10,000 square feet for shopping centers, about 20 units, is it, or 30? Uh, for apartment, 40. 40 units, 40. excuse me. And so by setting certain criteria, there's reliability in the data. Now, I would suggest that when you look at those criteria, if you then wish to make the investment, you know, at some point in your career, and you say, well, you know, I've got this 10 unit deal, it might track the same characteristics and performance, but you'll have to use the data that's on the larger set to help guide you for this. This is not a replacement for on the ground, you know, field work, if you will. This is fabulous desktop analysis. But I would suggest to you that anybody who uses this in the professional world as a just desktop and then never visits the property or doesn't actually know the market on the ground or doesn't interview local professionals in the market doesn't get the full picture. Uh, so once again, a tool. These are all great tools. Think if you've got your quiver here, you pull your arrows out, one arrow is probably not going to get you that, but if you keep using all those different arrows in your quiver, then you'll be able to finally get a sense of what's going on. Yes? So do, do you focus a lot on the value of the property, or like the appraisal, how much the property is Well, we're going, to show, we're going to show you a, a lot of these things. There yes. will be you know, data on what the property sold for uh, and uh, all the different uh, sale prices for the properties that are with Okay, but that's the main, I mean, when you look at that, you cannot, you and the data on the computer is not giving you any advice or anything. No, it's, it's, it's simply providing you with data and tools that you can use to make your own investment decision, right? Right. Anybody, you know, all, most clients that we work with will have their own data that they work off of, or they'll use data from multiple providers, and then use multiple data from different sources to make a decision. Does the algorithm behind this provide you with opportunities for you to do what ifs and that kind of scenarios? Yeah, we do have some tools that can do what ifs, um, but within the within the research tools that are uh, part of the subscription of the university, those tools are not part of that. But, but we have valuation tools and other things that can do some some what if analysis. We have other tools that can do stress situations and things like that. But we have other things we provide similar to that, but not in this. Not what we're going to go over today. It's not going to happen. And so I, I know I'm inserting myself a number of times here. Sure. Something that's also important to understand, what's really wonderful about your program is that you've got entry, if you will, into a whole set of tools, a whole set of organizations. Um, but um, this is all, we've done it for academic purposes, if you will. If you did a dive, for example, the report, he's gonna bring up a report on, on an office building or apartment building, that alone could be hundreds or thousands of dollars. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have a certain budget here too as well, and but the data is so valuable that frankly, you know, you can slice and dice it in many different ways. And, and if, if Claudius, if we find, and by the way, we can track everybody's data here and what they're doing, if you say, oh gosh, you're doing 348 reports, okay, you're slicing and dicing the data, but you know, stuff like that could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so there's a real benefit to be exposed to this, and hopefully, your exposure is actually going to make you more marketable, number one. Because your future employers, investors, your lenders are going to say, where did you get your information? Do you understand how to use these kinds of tools? And so we're giving you basically the ability to use it. And so we restricted it just a little bit here so you have, you're not overwhelmed by the data and you have the ability to hopefully use it successfully. Wait, let's get a question here, Rebecca. Um, I don't know if anyone else is like, going along with you on their computer, but I got a thing that saying your account is not configured for access. Okay. Did so you I don't just know if that's that like email? a student. No, like I searched like you did, and that's what came up. And you, you received your username and login? Yeah, like okay. I logged in. So is this something that has
Has anyone else had a chance to log in? So two I, I know. I searched the same thing. I was like going along with you and search Charlotte. We don't have access to that. You have to try counting. Okay. That's okay. What float? So so maybe it was a market. So we only gave everybody access to South Florida to the MSA, the Metropolitan Statistical Area that we're in, that covers six million people and how many thousand square miles. Um, so um, maybe next semester, next year, we'll see how the well, course goes. Well, I'm trying Palm Beach now. I'm going to see if it works. Right. In, in yeah, you know, okay, yeah, now it's working. That's okay, right. sorry. Right, that's right. What kind of, uh, so the database is from which you draw the data to compile. It's actually a transaction, MLS, it's a lot of different databases, correct? Right, so there are three major databases. One we call the rent, rent database, right? So that database is a chart and is collecting all the rent, space market. One is the sales database, so that's all the transactions that are happening. And then the third is the new construction database. So what's coming into the pipeline, and then we're following up with those properties to find out what phase of development that they're in. So we'll, we have a huge spreadsheet that will look at all new construction for apartments, let's say, going on in the Charlotte MSA. Right? What's all the new construction pipeline look like? What stage of development are they in? Uh, what's the size, the square footage of that? Uh, where's the property located? So we'll track all that information as well. So let's, let's dive into a property. I yeah. think that will help people understand yeah, what the tool can do. Yeah, let's get right into it. The other thing is custom polygon. I, I wanted to mention this. This is a great click, tool. Yeah, it's a great tool. It's a little radio dial. If you click this and you want to filter out some of the outliers that you're not interested in and draw sort of like a micro market, you can just double click on hover over a section of the map here. Double click creates a line here. So say I'm making sort of a triangle. So it takes out all the clusters or other properties that you may not be interested in, and then it will uh, populate and narrow down the search. So one way to uh, narrow down the search, if you will, is utilizing that custom polygon. Yes? Um, regards to the submarket, I know when you would click on the boundary. Yep. Now, what I'm doing is in another state, I don't know anything about Charlotte. Yeah. So how do you classify these submarkets? Yeah, we classify it based on economic, natural, and man-made boundaries. So, uh, yeah. Professor was talking about earlier, you know, what the local real estate market is classified, you know, uses that definition one, but we you know we say what's natural and economic and man-made. So we're uh, you know studying these markets to see how they've moved over time, how they've performed over time, and delineate based off of that. Well I guess my question is more regards like me. The, the, the yellow, for example, what do you classify that? Yeah. Market? So down here uh, you will see the submarkets, right? Okay. So, okay. Okay. so they'll have a name to it. Gaston and North, so these are all the different uh, neighborhoods or some markets, if you will, and they'll have a name to it. So there's another tool when we look at the map and the market reports that we click on it, it will tell you what the sub the name is. We'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that as well. On the left hand side, you can narrow down uh, using these filtering technical tools here based on asking rent, floor size for each one of these reports. Okay. So if you click on sales, these are all the sales transactions. You notice the push bins change, new construction, these are all the new Click on Generate Report. And uh, I'm going to pull all this up in PDF first. You do have the option of the raw data. So you get raw data as well as PDF, which is more presentation friendly, analyzes and summarizes the data, captures a lot of averages, and uh, some, some good analysis that you can do. Picture of the Charlotte Metro. Uh, you have a hyperlink, so you can actually click on any particular subject line here and it'll take you right into that. So we didn't have a subject property because remember earlier that address didn't have enough data that we looked at. So we just I just did a more of a high level search of all that Charlotte apartment area. So down here you can get a comp group market summary average. So what this is doing is saying all the different properties that are in our search criteria, what is their low, mean, median, and high for, for example, current asking rent per unit, vacancy, property size, year built, when were the properties built as an average, and uh, you know the different lows, highs, and means. And then it will break out a unit mix, right? So you have a studio, how much is a studio's current asking rent per unit within the comp set, an average. 
how much is a one bedroom cost, a two bedroom, a three bedroom? Um, so let's, let's stay on this, because this is a, a, a good little bit of uh, exercise, because we're going to be talking today about multifamily properties, and we're going to do a case study. I did a, uh, a, a development uh, project in Pittsburgh, actually, two years ago, using Restate it from the desktop as well, uh, and it was very helpful. So if you look at this chart, hopefully people can read it, you've got good eyesight. And so Michel basically said, hey, here are our general market pieces of information. But if you know nothing about this market, and assume that this is Charlotte, and we see information on studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms, and before we get deeper in to the numbers, what can you tell me that's interesting about this? Can, can you read it, by the way? Mm -hmm. Make it larger. Studios, 504 bucks, three bedrooms, 1200 Here we go, much bigger. And you see all this information. What can you tell me without knowing anything else about the market? Charlotte, yes? The asking price for a square foot goes down in the bedroom capital. That's right. OK, that's a good first observation. Yes? There's a higher demand for two bedrooms. Well, OK, now that's real interesting. Why did you say there's a demand for two bedrooms? Um, just because of the comparables are showing the, the number of units that they are. Uh, so there's 125 for two bedrooms. So I'm assuming okay, so, so you made a huge leap, which may be correct, because this is not about demand. Oh. This is about supply. But yeah, so I'm assuming that you looked at this and said, gee, you know, most properties are predominantly two bedroom. And so. Victor said, gee, I guess that's where demand is. Probably correct, too. But don't make that inference okay. right now. This is why I'm asking about this. Yes, sir, um, what else? Yeah, the current vacancy rate for the studios as compared to the vacancy rate of 11.1% mm -hmm. at the higher rate. All right, so now, now, this is a supply issue. This gives you a little indication of demand. Okay. okay, and so you may say, look at that. Uh, but once again, it's not a full picture, but gee, 11% vacancy rate in three bedrooms, maybe there aren't that many families who are doing that. Yes? Uh, the rent in the area is particularly strong. Uh, what about the rent? I'm sorry? It's not strong in that area, of that market. All right, so strong, why, did you, why are you using that adjective? I mean, averaging a uh, two bedroom, 86 cents per square foot. Uh, but compared to what? And so here's another thing you have to be really careful about. Numbers, of and in themselves, and this is going to be a theme for everything that I ever teach, and I'm sure Dr. Forgey will tell you as well. Numbers alone don't tell you a story. It's got to be compared to something else. And so while you said, gee, you know, the rent here is like 90 cents a square foot, you probably want to compare that three-bedroom rent to another market's three-bedroom rent. Comparing it to the 153 here doesn't necessarily make sense because we're maybe talking about different kinds of demand. This is all the single folk, right? These are the larger families. Yes, Carl. Uh, maybe jump ahead a little bit, but is there a way you can compare one submarket to another using this program? Uh, yeah. Yes. yeah, so we have a submarket we'll report. Yeah. Yep. That, that's there a great point. So, so just, that was just a little bit of a tease there to understand that you can really, once you begin to think about these things and you get the experience, you can look at it and you begin to develop some assessments. I remember you asked earlier, you said, well, uh, do they give you the answers? They don't give you any answers here. They give you the data that you, in turn, will make the judgment and assessments about what it means. All right, so please. So based on that, you would build studios, right? Well, uh, wait, <laughs> that's, that's a great point. Wait, I'm out. Really interesting. OK, so Tula is ready to build studio <laughs> All right. Why? Why did because you say that? The vacancy, there's not enough of them. Vacancy rate is really no, it's low. low. And they're asking for square foot is $1.53. So that certainly seems to make sense. Once again, you don't know how many units there really are in the marketplace. So. The first guess is, yeah, it would be great. I don't know if have you ever seen an apartment building with all studios, except in Manhattan. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so once again. It's only 66. Well, no, that, 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 that's right. No, that's no. right. So, 
Actually, oh, this is interesting. actually, the top chart is not related to the bottom that's chart. That's right. Not, not the, at all. In the sense that the top chart is, is strictly a market overview. So those are the market characteristics. The bottom chart of studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, those are separate characters. So there are only two studio units within the, the market that is being analyzed. Right. So, so basically, uh, it's fascinating. It, it's a little, it's a trick. I guess yeah. uh, for 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 the new. Uh, uh, they are so, different. Yeah. So once again, um, that's why a little bit of data can be a dangerous thing. Okay, but but you're starting on the path to thinking about these concepts. So I do want you to think about. It. Okay, please. Sure. Yeah. So lease terms provide a sub market expense ratio. So everyone familiar with expense ratios? I don't think that you're going to have to help with that. Sure, expense ratio is just basically for, for every dollar of revenue that's coming in, how much is the landlord having to put back into operating expenses, right? So you know, what's the net? So that, from that you figure out what the, what the net uh, revenue or net profit the, person, the uh, property is taking in. So for every dollar, 20, 30% goes back into the operating that particular building, uh, then, you know, 20 cents. Or, 20, 80 cents of a dollar or whatever uh, would go back in net. So here it's just breaking out the average expense ratio for, you know, let's say for one dollar is 38.20% of that dollar that's going back into that property, into the group of properties. Okay, so just to make sure everybody really does understand the math, so essentially, let's make it easy for us. So the rent for one bedroom is about a dollar. And basically it's saying 38 cents of every dollar is going to the operations for the time. You have a date there of 630. Um, when, when would this data be updated again so that it could be pretty close to real time? Sure. Uh, so the data is going to be, uh, you know, as we talked about earlier, quarterly basis. So this is what Q, or so Q3. So the next data will be the, the next quarter. Right? So when is that? Like to By the way, this is pretty current. So I, I know you're saying real time. We're so used to in this world saying, that's my instantaneous read. But uh, <coughs> given the information here, I would feel pretty comfortable if I did a study on a whole host of other factors that this is current. And the only thing that might change that, what would change the data from not being valid or current? New products coming on the market. Well, Financial maybe market that's changes. a different issue. What else? Financial market changes. Uh, that's one, and something else. Interest rate and all of that. They're all good. What? So what is about to happen in a day? Uh, maybe a hurricane. Uh, you know, that could come by, and it could wipe out the market. Okay? So don't think just about financial issues. That's good, financial changes. And we're going to talk later about, gee, something happened in the stock market. So remember. Um, but natural events, if you will, climate, earthquakes, war. More, that's right, that's right. This all affects real estate, which is why I'm having you all read the newspapers, because all these things affect things. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so here you get rent growth comparisons. Now what, what this report is providing you is a comp group versus uh, the Charlotte Metro. So the group of properties that we pulled out in our comp set uh, compared to the Charlotte market overall. So Q2 2015, what has been the asking rent growth rates, and then we'll break out a five-year annualized average. So this is actually going back five years. We're doing that for rent here. Uh, we're also doing that down here for vacancy rates. And then we have a growth trend forecast. So going all the way back to 2010 on a per year-by-year -year, uh, snapshot, we've got asking rent per unit, uh, percentage changes. So it looks like asking rent percentage changes actually from 4.6% in 2010, it's really gone down to 1.5. So vacancy rate, as you can see the market, 5.9 in 2010, down to about 3. Well, right, so he's, he's giving some great information here. So now, if you look at these two columns, you can make an assessment or judgment about what's going on in this particular sub-market's uh, part market, right? What's going on? Um, what, I, what I can tell is that uh, there's growth Area. So I guess population is increasing, there's more jobs, people are moving in and whatnot, so basically it's decreasing. Well, uh, that's we can the, test that theory. You can test it. Okay. Uh, and once again, so you just did a broad brush. Uh, yes. So you can see it's dropping and the rent's increase? 
Market, so the name here, North West Shore, this is actually North West Charlotte. Uh, tell what's the current asking rent per unit for this particular property? What's its vacancy rate? Uh, property size, floors, year built, and then the class is here as well. So this happens to be a DC. And here we have a timestamp. This is uh, you know very valuable information because uh, you know a lot of data providers may not put that out there. So we make sure that we are updating that information, saying when was this last verified. So when was the data updated, and when was it quality controlled? Put the timestamp on that. And a breakout of uh, some of these key data points here by unit mix. So the, the list will just go down here for each property. So these are the same tables that we just talked about at the beginning for right. each property in the bigger things. Correct. So I'm going to jump into the sales. So I, what I did is I went back to the table of contents, clicked on the subject property hyperlink, uh, and then down here, we didn't have a subject property specifically, but here's a summary statistic, low average and high number of units, year built. And now we're getting into sales price information. Right? 49 properties came up by most recent sales for this particular market within apartments. So it's saying the low sale price was 285, the high was over 88 million. Here's our average here, uh, sale price per unit number of different properties of 49. The map of all the different sales going on in that area. And just a listing. So here you'll get the address, uh, the submarket, year built floors, number of units, sales price, and the sale date information here as well. All the way on the right hand side. So quickly. And then I want to bring your attention to this. So a lot of our clients utilize this for cap rates as something Cap rates, are you guys familiar with what cap rates Everybody are? Everybody knows what a cap rate is. Right. You do? All right, what's a cap rate? Give me a definition. You're all confident, right? Research, you know? Oh, wait, what's that? Okay, wait a second. Uh, let's see, who hasn't spoken? Who hasn't raised their hand? Okay, all right, back to you. Oh, uh, okay, is, is the revenue that I mean, a person gets from investing, what they put in the property, what the amount of money they can get back in a year or something like that? Closer. Why don't you give them a shot? It's pretty close. I mean, you have the right idea there. I mean, a cap rate is basically a, what's called capitalization rate, right? How much income are you going to be potentially generating? But it also, cap rates in commercial real estate are very subjective. So one uh, group may define it or interpret it one way versus the other. It's really just what net operating income 
divided by the purchase price. So what's the net operating income that I'm going to be getting from this particular property divided by its purchase price to get a sense of a lot of uh, individuals use cap rate for risk assessment. You know, the lower the cap rate, the less risk there is, uh, you know, if all things are equal, and then the higher, or vice versa. That's just one high level way of looking at it. Yes, Carol. And that net operating income figure doesn't have the cost of financing. Does uh, the interest? That's correct. And so we'll get into that, and you'll have that opportunity a little bit later, just after lunch today, <laughs> to understand some more of these concepts. But net operating income is before you deal with the loan, the debt, and everything like that. And so what's interesting is Vishal said, usually when your cap rate is lower, it looks like it's less risky, but you're also getting a lower return. And so some of you probably realize, you know, when you get a higher return, it's because the market says, you know, we're really not sure that this is a safe investment, so you're being compensated for that risk. Another hand up. Yes? The lower the cap rate, is it? The, uh, the lower the cap rate, you know, you can just do the equation. So yeah, I guess you could say that. So cap rate equals NOI divided by purchase price, right? So if the cap rate is lower, or the bottom number it could be higher or lower. It all depends. It all depends. So once again, this is why cap rates. You hear them talked about. People toss the numbers around. We have to know. We talk about the same property. We talk about the same class. About the same size, we're talking about the same sub market. So, you know, one man's 5% may not be another woman's 8%. You know, it's just very different. Right. And then, depending on what side of the table you're on, are you a buyer or seller, right? A buyer may want a lower, a higher cap rate, or, you know, or a seller might want a lower cap rate. So, it depends on what side of the transaction you're on, too. Uh, so, here's a, a property information, your location, it's a market rate rental. We're providing you sale date, what the sale price was, and also how did we verify this information. In this case, we verified it through public records, so that's stamped over here. Uh, and then who the seller was, who the buyer was in this particular transaction, any additional comments or insight that we may have on this particular sale would be here. And the right-hand side, this is very valuable to a lot of our clients. So we do what we call a cap rate pro forma, so a 12-month projection of what the cap rate would be based on our own estimates. We'll, we'll report on any provided cap rates by uh, the selling party or purchasing party if we have that data here. In this case, we don't. But we also do our own projections. So here, what we do is we take a lot of our rent data or space market data uh, and uh, use a combination of properties, sub-market, metro averages to uh, determine uh, potential rent revenue, what the effect of rent revenue is. Just going through each one of these line items really at a high level to determine what we talked about, the net operating income. So we're estimating this to be around this amount. Uh, we're estimating uh, and then the purchase price being divided by that to come up with this 8.7 going in cap rate based on the sale price of this. So, so what has happened is now they've taken market data, and this site is all about market data, and in fact created a simple financial pro forma, which is really helpful. Right. And the other thing that's really good about this is I know someone had asked about what if scenarios. For the cap rates there is, you could actually go into the Excel and if you had some additional insight or you disagree with the numbers, for example, we have defaulted certain things at certain you know, credit loss at 1%, you could actually change any one of these numbers. There's a built-in uh, formula there that will just recalculate the cap rate based on your own numbers. So if you think rent revenue should be something else, or it goes, what, what will the cap rate look like? If one of these numbers go down or go up, the Excel version of this can actually do that for you. So those of you who have had some financial analysis exposure or have done this in, in your classes, you can see this becomes a really good tool. And so as if you're working on the investment side, you can quickly figure out some of the answers and do sensitivity analysis or what if scenarios. All right, so that's the sales uh, report that I wanted to show. I'm going to go back up to uh, have some data here on uh, here. The construction. So here's a listing of construction comps for apartment within the Charlotte Metro property, submarket listing, what type of, so, so we're including not only just market rate rental apartments here, we'll, we'll, construction will have some low income 
subsidized housing, size, number of buildings, and we're putting a stamp on when we expect that to groundbreak or complete uh, and status here. So a lot of these are completed, proposed. When we look at the Excel file, which I'll do in just a minute, uh, I think it can be really valuable. So you can use all that data and say what percentage of uh, all the under construction are at what phases, right? You can use that data and create trending and charts for yourself through reports. So, so as he switches to some of the other uh, data, maybe it's worth switching to the Excel, what we are developing is a pipeline. And so when you understand what I call the pipeline, and lots of others use this, of development, which is either under construction, under planning, or in process of being zoned, now you have the sense of how a market is expanding because that tells you what the future supply is in the market. And looking at supply is important because if you're making an investment and you say, I want to buy a property or a complex, you want to know who the competition is going to be. And also, it can help you figure out uh, the impact on demand. So let's see what Vishal comes up with next. Yeah, so I'm just going back to that. I think I lost that section. Just, just a quick question going back to credit loss. What, what, is, what is credit loss? Yeah, credit loss is just basically you know, how much will they get the revenue, right? So how much do they expect? So you estimate that X amount of you know what your expected inflow of money is based on people paying rent that you may not get. So you're already assuming that you know, one percent or two percent of uh, the total revenue I'm supposed to get will not be will be bad debt. Someone will not pay. Every property has that, mm -hmm. even the best ones. All right. So let's see what the next file. Looks like. So I'm going to uncheck these because we just looked at property comps, right? So we talked about that bottom-up approach. So we looked at everything all the way down to the property level. And now we want to move up to the submarket and metro level. Uh, here we've got, uh, looks like, let's look at the metro trend report. <coughs> and we should do class <coughs> as well. I think you'll find that useful. Right, let's start with these and the new construction list. Yeah. Now we're going to go into the Excel. So we've looked at a lot of visual representation of data, and now you get to see all the numbers behind that data. So this is going to give us all the raw data. Well, it is Excel 2007. So a little bit slower, folks. Yeah, we do have hotel, but for hotel, we only track sales. We don't track rent or construction data. So we have uh, hotel sales transaction data. Limited. 